So I'm here to talk to you about uh, disrupting the disruptor. And for a while, it was actually really painful for me to describe this talk with the word disruption because it's totally overused. And, and any time sort of marketing and advertising people hook on to something, we suddenly have like a year of the disruption and there's a new disruption conference. But I think it's an actually sort of an interesting subject to think about the reality of what does it look like to disrupt yourself? What does it look like for a company like mine, which is often in headlines as this sort of penultimate new media company that when I talk to friends in the US from companies like Hearst or Time Inc or Condé Nast or not so similar to yours, I always get the sense that they think I'm like sitting in this really cool startup-y fancy office kind of resting on my laurels that, that we're just counting cash because we figured it all out because we're not necessarily unwinding you know, print businesses or more traditional uh, revenue streams. But in fact, it's the exact opposite of it, that, that the things that, that motivate me every day and frankly, the things that frighten me and the things that make me worried, uh, will our business survive, I think aren't so dissimilar to yours. So that's what we're gonna sort of spend the next 15 minutes or so talking about. But first I wanted to get a sense of whether, who in this room, and I know you guys all touch different parts of the, the company, feel like you are part of the disruptive class, that whatever you're doing today is disrupting something else. Okay, so a couple, so that's good. Who in here spends more of your time fearing that you are right now being disrupted? I guess it's a, it's a scary place to admit that. <laughs> I suspect it might be a few more. And who in this room thinks at the same time you're both the disruptor and also the thing being disrupted? So maybe like five or 10. So that's how I feel. Um, and I think that's how Vox Media has organized itself around a recognition that that is the state of existence in media right now. That the notion of disrupting something in, in a linear way where there is a beginning and there is, there is an end is really quite false. And it's also quite risky and dangerous because that gives you the impression that at some point your work is done. So what I want to talk about is how do you organize a company that acknowledges this risk. So what I want to start with is, um, is Henry Ford, maybe because I'm American, maybe because he's one of the most iconic entrepreneurs um, that, that certainly our country has produced. And Henry Ford was a disruptor back in the day. And the way that he thought about building companies was around this notion of specialization. And you sort of see the production lines behind me, that everybody has a job to play, and everybody has a manager, and that manager has a manager. And that this, this, this idea around sort of really prescriptive um, job responsibilities is actually the way to build sort of a, a strong foundational company. And, and, it, and you can imagine how you might apply that to media. So if you are in the print business, you have someone who writes words, you have someone who edits the thoughts behind those words, you have someone who um, spell checks, someone who lays it out on the page, maybe someone else even picks the photos, someone operates the printing press, and yet again, someone else delivers that story to the masses on their doorsteps. And if you start questioning one part of that process, what you, what, you do, what you start to reveal is that there are lots of people whose livelihood are sort of dependent on this idea of keeping a job, of, of doing the thing that they've always done. And if you contrast that today, for example, in our company, just a couple months ago, we have a fashion business named Racked. And Rack just wasn't doing anything. It just wasn't differentiated enough. There were too many other big players in the, in the digital media fashion space. So with Rack, we've decided to shut down the website and go all in on Facebook. And so what does that mean for our business? Well, we have no advertising products that are Facebook exclusive, so we have to rethink how our sales team takes Rack to market. We have editors who cover things and publish those things to the web. That looks very different on Facebook. Uh, people don't really read a lot of text on Facebook. They prefer video. But video on Facebook looks a lot different than video on our O&Os. People don't watch three, four, five minute videos on Facebook. They watch Facebook videos without sound. So we've had to take all of these teams and reteach them how to tell stories in this new environment. And we made that decision as an executive team pretty much overnight. 
And so you can imagine that if you have a company that is organized around specialization, that you really risk um, having people at the bottom and in the middle who are resistant to change, who are sort of refusing to let um, their systems, their, their workflows be disrupted. So what we've, what we've realized is what you really need are this, this notion of a Swiss Army knife, that you need people who have lots of different skills, who are nimble, who are sort of open to this idea that the world is constantly changing, and so too they must change with it. Um, so three things that we're going to talk about that sort of we've organized our entire company around. The first is around culture. The second is around how do you think about a brand that is going to grow in an ecosystem, in an industry that it will look nothing like it does today in just one year's time. And then finally, we'll talk a little bit about our innovation strategy. So first, culture. Uh, so my team was mortified when I asked them to do this, because as you can see, you know, I run a creative organization who makes things really pretty, and I said, no, this is the idea. This is what our company looks like. It's this idea that we're always on a treadmill, and they're like, Lindsay, people fucking hate treadmills. Like, why would we describe our company and our culture on a treadmill? That sounds exhausting. And I was like, I know, but that's the point. The treadmill never ends. The, chain, the work is never done. That the thing that we did just two months ago is the wrong thing today. And I know that's really hard for you to understand, because this is your first job out of college and you've just signed up and there's a title and there's a job description and you have a boss, but now I'm telling you it's all about bots. And it's no longer about Twitter because Twitter's totally over. And guess what, Instagram just launched a competitor to Snapchat, so you better become an expert on that thing really quickly. And so it is a treadmill, it is a treadmill because treadmills don't turn off, they don't necessarily go anywhere, they're always going. But I also wanted to show that treadmills can be awesome. You can be like a dancer, like this guy, that's like a thing. Um, oh, there he goes. Um, uh, and, and, but you also fall off. And that was a really important thing. And I think my, my, my lesson here is that when you build a culture around constant change, you have to accept a couple things to be true. And one of those things is failure. And the reason you have to accept failure is because if you are too busy organizing policy, building um, consensus internally, asking all your friends and your colleagues who work at other media companies, and you wait for the rules to be written before you play the game, the game will be over by the time that you get in it. And so this notion of speed to market, of test and experimentation, is so critical today because everything is moving so fast. And I'll give you a very quick example. Facebook video, we, we see all of our growth right now on Facebook, and we've mandated all of our editorial teams to look at their Facebook traffic, their video traffic, as a, as a goal that they report on on a quarterly basis. And so we've seen phenomenal growth. The chart looks like this for Facebook video for all of our brands. But the chart, that if, if you ask now how many of those Facebook video views were monetizable, which our board happened to ask in the last board meeting after we were like, let's just get to the next slide really fast. And the answer is zero, which is a total conundrum as a business. I run the business, is that we're telling all of these people to, to build this Facebook uh, video strategy, and yet none of it is monetizable. So we had to figure out how do you monetize Facebook video before Facebook has an advertising solution. And the answer is we have no idea. But the, the lesson we learned was like nobody had any idea. Everybody was experimenting. Everybody was just trying things. And, and in order to be in the game, we just had to get started. And sometimes that can be uncomfortable. The next thing I'd like to talk to you about, big surprise, is brand. So when I joined the company two years ago, we were, and maybe even Chad Mum was here last, um, last uh, year, and Chad might have even be saying that we're a big website company. When I joined and I took over marketing, everything we did was we build big websites, we build big audiences. And now we have to build brands that have permission to program anywhere. So you see behind me, we have a television show coming out. We opened a museum. We participated, uh, the Verge, our technology brand, participated um, at a music festival. And the important thing here is when you talk about your brand as a digital-only company or as a print-only company, and you try and move into a different place, people, our, our customers, our audiences, feel like they don't want to give us permission to do that. They're like, no, you're a magazine. Why are you on TV? It doesn't work for me. So we realized we don't know what the future holds. We don't know if we want to pro program to Amazon Echo. 
we don't know how big bots are going to be. We don't know what the future of artificial intelligence or VR is going to be. But we do know that as a media company, we want to be able to play in all of those spaces. So we've had to change the way that we talk about ourselves so that we can do that. And finally, let's talk about innovation, maybe sort of second to disruption. Innovation might be <laughs> the, 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 the next overused word. But we think about innovation in the way that that, that our company is changing, that, it, that changing in the way that we tell stories, but also changing in the way that we think about the business, the way that we think about our constituents, and, and ultimately how we make money. So just, I'm going to put something up here. Um, just a year ago, if these are all of our SKUs, and we were a retail store, and these were the products on the shelves, one year ago, only four of these existed. So one year ago, we had four products that we had to build a sales story around, that we had to price, that we had to measure, that we had to create operational workflows between our business team and our editorial team. And that's everything that an advertiser can buy today. Which, when you think about it, is exhausting, right? That in with some of these, we've launched just in the past couple months. Virtual reality, Snapchat, We've failed at Snapchat and we're trying again. And so we're selling Snapchat in a totally different way. Facebook instant articles, totally new product. Facebook video, an unofficial product that doesn't exist, but we're trying to find a way to make it exist before Facebook is ready for it to exist. Is this on video? Uh, NBC Universal, we, we co-sell with one of the largest television companies. So my point to you is sort of similar to this idea of being ready to fail, is that the world that we're operating in, the world that advertisers expect and consumers expect is getting incredibly complex and diverse. And the reason for that is because we don't own the ecosystem anymore. It used to be as a media company, you got to decide how to tell stories. You got to decide what the world needed where they needed more journalism or more truth or more inspiration or more beauty. And then you got to decide and control the way that they consumed those stories, the where, the how, the when. And now there are so many other players in this space that you and I have no input over how they spend their time, how they think about their product roadmap. It's everything from, from uh, uh, um, uh, telecom companies who are determining data bandwidth, which impacts how, how people's pages load. Um, it's everything about phone, uh, phone manufacturers and platforms like Facebook and Instagram and Snapchat. And all of these people have a hand in, in dictating how our businesses are going to look in the future. So. I'll leave you with this, which is a video of a bunch of people running towards a Ford car. This was the most amazing thing anybody had ever seen. It was the ultimate marvel of, of, of the human collective, of all of those people, the person who did the door, the person who did the tile, the tire, the paint job. Um, this was the most incredible thing, and everybody traveled far and wide. And now, this is a video of just a couple weeks ago. And these are grown adults together, running. And does everybody know what they're running towards? A Pokemon. This, today, is the most amazing thing that people had seen in such a long time that the human collective had produced and it's not even real. And arguably, it's like a virtual cartoon uh, that requires your phone device. And people are doing it in community. And all of a sudden, overnight, we have, a poly we have Polygon. It's a gaming site. And our traffic has doubled because that's how interested people are in Pokemon. So interested that there's sociologists and psychologists thinking about how do we use this to, to, to bring communities together? How do we um, think about the world differently now that people have finally started to touch and taste the impact of, um, of AI? And this is, a, for me, a representation of just how unpredictable the future is, that how important it is for media companies to self-disrupt on a monthly basis, on a daily basis, because Pokemon came seemingly out of nowhere. 
And now we have a, what's our AI strategy? How do you advertise? How is this going to change the world? And I promise you that whomever is up on this stage in one year's time will be able to play a different video that has the power to fundamentally change the way that people tell stories, the way that we connect, and the way that we build businesses around it. So from there, I say, I hope that each of you sort of, if this is about the journey, sort of think about ways that you can inspire the systems and the people and the culture and the ways of thinking about innovation and the future in such a way that recognizes that, well, it can be equally exhausting to have to constantly reinvent everything that you're doing. But if you find those that have the athleticism, that have the entrepreneurial spirit, and really the stamina, you, can, you too can be part of sort of the change agent of the future. And if not, I fear that we're all going to watch someone else eat our lunch. Uh, and that's it for me today. It strikes me that you're always very data-driven. Mm -hmm. You always try to measure whatever can be measured. But still, journalism and content is always to an extent about intuition, experience, relationship, all those vague human qualities. How do you think about balancing that in, your, in developing your stuff? I mean, we talk a lot about this balance between art and science. I mean, there's an ethical question, which is like, if you only give people exactly what they want, are we really doing our part uh, as journalists? Now, this is certainly more true. We have a news brand. We also have brands that tell you what the latest and hottest restaurants are, what, what's on sale. So I think they're debating sort of different parts of that question. Um, we like to say that we're data informed, not data driven. So there are lots of media companies that have leaderboards on the wall and that journalists who have the highest traffic are sort of lauded and, and maybe even to some degree compensated for that. Um, we don't operate that way. I think where what, what you risk by moving too far in that direction is that there's a lot of focus on headlines or clickbait and not necessarily a lot of focus on deep engagement. And I'll even make a business case that it's deep engagement that you monetize. Um, in, a, in a really transactional way because, you know, the lower someone goes down on a page, the more ads you serve them on a conceptual way because when we sell our audience to an advertiser, we're selling an engaged audience that comes to really dig deep and spend time with us as a brand. Um, I also will add that I think the third thing you risk is getting into this mode, which was sort of like the second phase of the internet where everybody was just trying to focus on the data around algorithms and around those traffic sources. And when those algorithms change and you don't have a real editorial strategy, um, your business becomes pretty vulnerable. Yeah, I was going to ask about that. How, how dependent are you on the, on the just share, sharing economy of information, the, the Facebook algorithm, the Google algorithm? Yeah, so I'll say this. Um, a year and a half ago, if I was talking about social platforms, the conversation would be around referral traffic, that those are platforms that push people into our owned and operated dot coms. Um, it's fundamentally different now. And I would say this is if there was one change that has completely um, reorganized the way that we operate as a company, the way that we organize goals, is that we recognize that they are no longer traffic sources, that they are platforms where people are consuming content, they are not leaving those platforms. So and that's very different. you are different. not a destination anymore the way you used to be a destination? No, we are not. People are not coming from Facebook pulling. I mean, certainly we, we have traffic that is sourced from Facebook, but people are consuming our content on Facebook through so instant so articles, through Facebook video. And that's a massive shift, especially in terms of a business model, because your advertising solutions are organized around your own .com. So if people aren't coming to your .com, you have to figure out new advertising products that can exist in environments like Facebook that you don't control. But a lot of editors would be skeptical or even scared to decide to go and publish all their stuff on Facebook because you really hand everything away, but you still think that that's the way to do it. Well, here is the dilemma. If everybody in this room represented your entire audience for a particular brand, and everybody in this room said, I love your stuff, I love, I love that, that, that column you write every morning, um, but I only want to consume it on Facebook. And if you're not going to put it on Facebook, I'm not really interested because I want to I digest my news and information in a different way. Do you say, what do you say to that? Yeah. 
Well, yeah. You say. Yeah. Hmm. Okay, then, huh. I guess. Huh. So yeah. that's what we're debating. I mean, we've, we've, I mean, we're a portfolio company, which is great, so we can run some experiments. So we've put a handful of our brands where all of the content is available in Instant Article. Um, the challenge for us is we've built advertising products like native ads, branded content, um, sort of non-standard, beautiful video ad solutions that Facebook doesn't accept right now. So that's our sort of parallel path strategy is, OK, if we're going to give you all of our content, if you are going to be able to sort of be the ecosystem, then you have to match our expectations around what quality advertising looks like. Mm -hmm. And those are the conversations that we're having with Facebook right now, which is, OK, let's meet in the middle. If you're going to be the platform, then we want some input on how that platform performs um, you know, for the people who are paying for our content. So for the, the image you showed with that looked like a wheel where you saw all the new services that have come yeah. about in the past year, that made me think again what we talked about this morning, like a, a series of innovations that might be, may be functional for a short time. And then we leave that and we move on to something else and exactly. we leave that. So that's the way to operate. Totally. It's called, it's, it's in, in engineering culture, it's called an MVP strategy. So we push out the minimum viable product. We push out something that we know enough about that it's not going to completely break us or our partners. And you test it mm -hmm. because you really can't spend all of your time trying to get something perfect because something new, and this is legit, I'm not even saying this um, euphemistically, like there will be something new tomorrow. You know, Facebook Live didn't exist four months ago. Yeah. And now I have a meeting every week around Facebook Live. So among the things that we saw on your, on your wheel picture, what are, what are one or two that you think looks the most promising for a combination of content and, and a healthy economy around the content? Sure. So branded content is a huge part of our overall revenue. I joined the company, and I'll just give you sort of aggregate numbers versus percentages, and we did about $9 million in branded content or native advertising. Um, in one year's time, I took the 9 million to 30 million. And this year, I'm going to take it to 75 million. So hopefully, that means I'm really good at my job. But I think it also represents that there's a massive appetite and demand for brands who want to connect with their audiences through storytelling. But they don't want to do that in a way that's just sort of feel good, nice, like, OK, I'm going to write a story and hope content marketing kind of you know, pushes some product on the shelves. So that's really where you have to wrap that business, that native advertising business, with the same level of data that's available to advertisers, um, with the same level of reporting and accountability around ROI. And then finally, it has to be good. You know, there's a ton of really terrible advertorial content because native advertising has become so popular. And a lot of smaller media companies that don't have the resources to build a full editorial engine to do this brand-related content that, um, that the industry is kind of, I don't know, a little polluted right now. But certainly, I would say for anybody in this room, at least it's been true in the US market, that there's um, a tremendous amount of demand around content marketing right now. So 75 billion, are you able to share with us how much of your revenue on an annual basis that is? So let's say it's, it's the way that we look at sort of buckets of revenue is a different. So I won't ask it in connected. To, I won't answer that in connected to that. But I will say about two of every three deals has a piece of content as part of the deal. Okay, well, that's a little promising for those of us who love content. It's massive, but it, but getting it right is the challenge. You know, getting it. I mean, making the like brands don't have content problems, right? They have business challenges, and content is a way to address those business challenges. But I think you know, there's a lot of examples of of media companies doing that pretty poorly. So I think if you can become great storytellers in the same way that you are editorially on behalf of brands, and you can build the infrastructure around that, it's a very interesting business right now. So my final question to you: You've been analyzing this and working with understanding this for a long time. If you could travel back in time and collectively slap us in the face and tell us what oh. to do 15 years ago, uh, in other words, what we need to be, where we need to be headed, what is the main important takeaway from what you've learned that we immediately should get to doing? Wait, I'm slapping you in the face. Yes, you can. Your, the, if you your can. face today. 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 Not, not well, your I mean, you can decide at any time you want to slap our face. But, oh, but you know, okay. let's, let's say today. Um, I mean, I, I really think it is, so, so one way to describe all of these things that I talked about is, is not being precious. Precious in what meaning? Not being precious in the sense that Snobbish? just, uh, 
there's like an important distinction between being precious and being snobby, and I'm not sure what it is, but it's like, it's like porn. You know it when you see it, but it's weird to explain. Okay. So see, they we, said so I we would don't not get a laugh, and porn always gets the laugh. Strange, um, huh? No, not being precious. That, that not like letting go, right? That, that part of moving forward is letting go of what is no longer working. And there's a lot of things that we do that we have incredible nostalgia around, right? And your nostalgia might be around print. I don't even, I don't know what print nostalgia looks like, although sometimes I want us to start a magazine because I would love my brands to be sitting on a coffee table. But we have nostalgia around three-minute videos. I was talking to the editor-in-chief of The Verge, Nilai, who's amazing, and he has this video team, and they tell these beautiful cinematic stories. They have incredible production value. They're using drones. They have green screens. And you tell them, and you say, Nila, can we take a look at your video statistics? And you're like, I don't know how to tell you this, but remember that like random video you did on your iPhone? because you were at like CES and it was an unboxing of a new gadget, that did like 10 million views. And your three minute video that took three weeks and $40,000 to make did like 100,000 views and only like 200 of them watched it to the end. Like as a storyteller, that's heartbreaking because unfortunately what people want isn't always what we want to give them. You know, and that's a weird come to Jesus moment inside of a company. And when you have the, when you don't have data, it's easy to avoid those uncomfortable conversations. You're like, of course they look. Like, how amazing this is! Come There's to drones. Jesus moment. I think that was is that my a term that, I, that everybody now uses? it is now it is a term. Yeah. So that's what I mean about not being precious. About when the data suggests that you should be thinking about something differently, you've got to like have a drink, sit down, put it away. You know say thank you for its service to you, and then move on, because everyone else has moved on, probably. Lindsay, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thanks.